Okay, boy. So we have the red Gondor player Farad at the bottom right side versus the blue Isengard player Dunedain at the, at the top left side. I mean, he knows the matchup. He will open with a Uruk pit and a furnace, and the Uruks are leading forward. This is the map Fidian Zeal with a couple of extra settlements. It's a, um, you know, pretty medium-sized map, I would say. It's not too big, it's not too small. Uh, it's a new map, added from the patch 2.22, alongside with many, many other new maps you can actually try out yourself. And as you guys know, the good campaign is finished for this patch, and very soon we're gonna also be able to finish off the evil campaign, hopefully. Goku, thank you for the 100 bitty bomb, appreciate it. Also happy with the little one, Shanks, I just heard it last night. Thank you very much, my friend, appreciate it, thank you. How important is it to random in 1v1 uh, in the patch 2.22? A random mirror is always, how can I say, you know, you need to wall check always, that's very important. At the beginning of the game, you need to know if your opponent is actually evil player or good player. That's most important. If you know that, then it doesn't really matter if, for example, you play Gondor, right, against a random faction. You wall check, then you know it's an evil faction. Then it doesn't really matter that much if it's Mordor or Isengard, but it's important for you to know if it's evil or good. That's the most important thing. Okay, I mean again in a tournament game like this, I'm always the host player, so nobody nobody has an advantage and we don't pick random in this tournament. But again, every tournament has a different format and they are trying to switch up the things a little bit to make it more entertaining and also at the same time more balanced. So land has been used on the land, the Uruks, they don't have leadership, but they can still fight in a 2v1 situation, 2v3 situation. And remember, he will be able to bring more and more Uruks and during all this time the mill in the in the back is still untouched. This map got reworked a little bit, so there was actually a free settlement, but it was a little bit too much. You know, when you have three settlements or more than that, evil factions have a huge advantage over the good factions, because Lumber Mills, they are able to generate much more and much faster resources. Um, I don't think it's a smart idea to fight this. When you want to fight in a spot like this with Gondor, what you want to do is you want to hack the building, hack the wall. If you do that, the outnumbered advantage doesn't matter anything. But look at this situation, right? Because the soldiers are fighting here, but the Uruks are able to surround them. And remember, in a Uruk battalion, you have way more units. And when they get the chance to surround you, then it's over for you. So you need to position yourself multiple times to get the perfect positioning to stall the fight a bit longer. And during all this time, we have a stable coming up for the Gondor. He will have the Gondor Knight on the field very soon. The Uruk pit is gonna get level 2 after the next Uruk. It's gonna give the Isengard the chance to get some pikemen up on the field to counter the enemy Gondor Knights. It's not a huge map, right? It's a pretty medium-sized map, I would say. Like you said, it's a bit similar to the map Rohan from the layout, from the size. But actually, it's, you know, still way, way longer than Rohan. Rohan would be around this area. The, the second castle would be around this area. And you have still creeps on this map, multiple creeps in the middle which Isengard buff will creep, and he will get two new settlements. Again, that's gonna mean that he will have four Lumber Mills under his control for the maximum wood bonus of 30%, which will make those buildings inside the castle way, way cheaper. Okay, Urukpit level 2. And also in the patch 2.2, what you can do is you can sell the units. For example, the Uruks, if he doesn't want to have them on the field anymore, you can just send them inside the Citadel and you are good to go, you know? I mean, with the evil factions, you could also do that before in the slaughterhouses, which, again, was a downside for the, for the Isengard faction, because Isengard normally doesn't build slaughterhouses, because furnace are just much better. They will give you the steel bonus, you know, cheap upgrades. But uh, the good factions couldn't do that. Now every faction has the chance to send the units inside the citadel, in the middle of your castle, and then you can get money back. And you don't need to feed your opponent, you know, with power points and experience points. And he's, you know, peeling back with the Uruks. But the problem is that the second more pikemen are going to be recruited, it's going to be kind of tough for the, for the Gondor player to keep the map control. That's why in this matchup, very important, you need to build a barracks like Farad does. Very good. I like this. And also in the patch 2.2, what you can do is you can combine the soldiers with the tower guards to counter the war riders. Caleb, thanks for the, for the 16 months, my dude. 16 months. Holy guacamole. Caleb WDE just resubscribed for 16 months. Ahoy. Hey Shanks and Stream, hope you are having good day less than three. Thank you very much, my friend. I'm uh, actually having a fantastic day today. 
especially because now I'm able to stream. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you have also a good day, my friend. Appreciate it. Oh, Warchant. Um, it doesn't work on the land, but the second you leave the land, you will get the... Oh, he stole one part of the money too. It's okay, I think, because Gondor is still, what? Three farms, four farms outside, which is very good. Um, creeping is very important. So Gondor has only two power points collected so far. He was barely able to save the Gondorite. Don't run into them. They are level almost three. Very important to save them. Um, what you are aiming for when you play Gondor against Isengard is to get three power points ASAP, right? Because you will need to unlock the Ranger Summon, which will ex be extremely helpful and also necessary at the same time to counter the Pikeman spam. So when you go for a Beast Rush with your three Gondor Knights eventually later on, and shields and blades, um, Isengard will obviously try to defend himself with multiple pikemen. And when you summon the rangers at the same time, you can actually hunt the enemy pikemen with your rangers and then deal devastating amount of damage with your Gondor Knights. Gondor opening with barracks is good versus Eisen. If it's predictable, no. If it's not predictable, yes. So if you do always the same strategy, your opening will kind of predict it and counter that, right? But if you do one time with Barak start, one time normal start, it's, you know, obvious you have a, when you have the surprise effect, it's going to be very good. In the patch 2.22, the Barak is a bit cheaper, so it's definitely a, you know, reliable option to open with the Barak against any faction, not only against Isengard, but also against Mordor and Rohan even. But if you do always the same opening, it's going to hurt you. And the thing is, if you open with a Barak, you know, obviously it will, you know, kind of slow you down a little bit and you will not be able to build up the stable as early as you would like to. But Gondor is creeping a lot. I really like that. There's also shields. Uh, heavy armor plus forge blades. Didn't go for the shields yet. So I'm assuming Farad is not planning to go for the base rush. But Dona has now the, the warp pit. So all just with heavy armor. Very good actually. But that is Lourdes. Lourdes is going to be able to get free experience here. Level 2 are already unlocked. Level 5 massive power spike, and also later on, he's one of the best, if not the best, counter to Gandalf. But again, you know, spamming soldiers and giving them upgrades is gonna cost you lots of money. And look the eco from Gondor, right? It's not looking very good, and it will eventually delay your Gandalf quite a lot. And it needs to pay out, right? It needs to pay out. If you don't succeed with the Barak spam, uh, you will lose map control. And you will lose lots of money and momentum. Again, you don't want to give Isengard too much map control. Because then he will have the chance to buy the outpost here on the top. And seat you. Like, this is an investment of 800, right? You build the, bar you build the outpost, but you cannot protect it. It's not good. Yeah, Farad is gonna. And also the, match, um, the color from the scoreboard is always matching with the color in the game. So you can see red Gondor is Farad. He has also the red color in the scoreboard. The first base rush is going to happen, but does he have shields? And uh, no, it means he will take actually lots of damage from the towers. And he got to be careful against pikemen. When the last thing you want to do is trample them. Oh, he's selling them. He sold them. <laughs> I think it was accidentally. <laughs> he was sending the pikemen straight into the citadel, you know? He was selling them, but it's okay. The barracks placement is very important. I like the barracks placement a lot. And many people are making the mistake to build the barracks at the front, right? And if you do that, the Gondor player will have the chance to easily take it down. Then you build it behind. So, for example, this side is facing this opponent, right? And you want to build it behind like it does. So, the opponent player has to commit fully inside your castle or go around it, which will buy you enough time. And also your towers are going to be able to shoot them permanently. Because you need to understand that your most valuable and most important structure inside your castle is your Uruk Pit. If you lose the Uruk Pit, you will lose such a big momentum because, again, you need to get it to level 2 before you can produce any more pikemen. So the placement is very important. Yes, outpost, but um, the soldiers, they have no chance against the Vorks. They have no chance. Are you going to play against the winner? I can, but not today, I think. I need to train a little bit. Dunedain, I mean, whoever wins, even Farad, they are actually very, very good players. And I didn't play since like three weeks at all. Not a single game. So I would like to play one or two games. And then we can tomorrow get a, get a game, of course. Why not? Multiple Gondor Knights are going far forward. 
they have the shields now. One of them is level 4, level almost 3, and level almost 2. Power point wise, Isengard actually went for the Tinted Land. A tinted Land got a rework in this patch. It only costs you now 2 power points, but your Freezing Rain is going to cost you 7. So, we made sure that every weather changing ability, from Freezing Rain to Darkness to the Cloud Break from the Gondor and Rohan faction, have always the same power point cost. 7 power points for each of them. So it's a bit a bit of a, of a buff to the Isengard early game, but a bit of a nerf to the Isengard lead game. Okay, now we have the legendary combination of soldiers and tower guards. I like this combination a lot actually. They gonna counter automatically the ward riders. I mean, they are not countering as a as a tower guard in the porcupine formation. You can still trample them as you can see, but they can't fight them in a one on one situation anymore, right? And there is a way to counter that. So what Isengard can do is make either normal combos with Uruks and Crossbowmen and counter them. Or what you can do instead is you can just make Uruk Pikeman combo yourself. Your Uruk Pikeman combo is way stronger than Tower Guard Soldier combination because the specialty of the Isengard forces is actually infantry. So nobody beats in an infantry versus infantry fight the Isengard infantry units. Taking too much damage. Losing map control, Farad actually kind of falling apart. What you can also do is build the marketplace. Because normally, if this game doesn't end within the first 8 to 10 minutes into the game, it will be a long game. And marketplace is a very uh, great investment into the mid to late game. And also in this patch, you can now demolish your marketplace once you purchase all the upgrades. Um, that means it doesn't need to block a spot from your castle anymore. Yeah, we increase the movement speed of the units, yes. So it's a bit faster, especially good for the infantry units, because as you guys know, in the normal version of the patch of the BFME 1, the infantry for the good factions was always kind of meh, because they were moving way too slowly. Now everything is a bit faster, you know, the production of the, of the structure is a bit faster, uh, unit movement speed is a bit faster, so everything has to be increased equally because if you just make the units faster, then it's gonna kind of hurt the evil factions because they won't be able to produce the units as fast as they normally do. So everything got the same percentage increasement of the speed, production speed, and also unit movement speed. We have lots of work riders upon the field, four power points almost in the bank. He has outposts here. He will get a lot of money very, very soon. And also archer range could be actually a good investment. But you can take a look into the minimap, so we can see that Isengard is over 70% of the map, which is very really good for Isengard, and he's only 2 power points away from the Field of Fires. Um, against Gondor, you don't need Freezing Rain, because Gondor is a faction that doesn't build on leadership, right? And you can just skip that and go for the Field of Fires instead, and with this many Lamermills on the field, you will grow rage in no time. Are you all dead? But Lourdes is going to be able to hit in safety. He's also level 5 by now, by the way. It means 60% more damage and also fear resistant at the same time. Fear effects actually a huge thing in this patch because the fear affects now units when they are level 1 and level 2 at the same time. So either you will need fear resistant or you will need uh, level 3 units to be immune to the fear of Horn of Gondor, for example, Cloudbreak, the Elendil from Aragorn and any other effect. effect. Gondor is able to win this because Isengard has no upgrades on his units, but again, even now, um, they are taking way too much damage and feeding power points. Like, it's so good for Isengard because he keeps three Gondor Knights busy at the same time, you know? That's very good. Six power points almost in the bank. Gondor is only at one power point. So Gondor needs actually at least one more for the Gondor to fight, but again, money is not looking good because he keeps spamming units all the time, right? And he needs to upgrade them every single time. He needs to invest 480 because he has only 4 blacksmiths, right? <laughs> That's not good. That means there is a chance we might not be able to see Gandalf at all. He also lost the outpost at the same time at the top right, so he's definitely falling apart. And now we have reached a stage of the game in which the Isengard castle has an increased durability, right? It's so tanky now. Level 3 furnaces with, what, 6000 HP, 5500 HP, and every single one of them is able to shoot. So even if you go inside the base, you will encounter like every single building shooting at your face and it will deal constant damage 
which not even your gunner knights with the full upgrades of shields and heavy armor can withstand for a long time. Yeah, I mean, 2.22 uh, is um is a project which is like obviously, uh, you know, like a passion project. We are working on it frequently. I mean, to be honest, I didn't work on it like for the last four four weeks because I was like busy with the PB. But it's a project we will be working on all the time, and the new launcher makes it possible. So that means whenever there is a new update available, you don't need to manually download anything anymore. You can just press one button, and you are always up to date. We have the White Wizard upon the field, boys. Unfortunately, not from Gondor, but from Isengard. The outpost is going to be taken down, but it's okay. What Isengard needs to do is, you keep, you know, you can buy this Chaos uh, Outpost and start sieging. And no, no heroes at all. Like, it, at this point of the game, it's just too late for Boromir and for Faramir. Why? Because there is a Lord with level 5. That means even your Boromir Horn of Gondor is going to be useless now. Boromir is an early mid-game hero. Late game, at this point, there is no point of getting Boromi on the field because you will have a hard time. Uh, too fun with the 10 gifted subs to the channel. Too fun, my friend. Appreciate it. It really means. Oh my goodness, man. Thank you. Thank you. I will represent the men of Gondor. Just gifted 10 subs. What a pirate. Thank you, my friend. Really means a lot. How are you doing today? And Gandalf the White, thanks for the follow, appreciate it. <laughs> Wally Molly. <laughs> is there a way to play manually without a launcher? Um, what do you mean? I mean, you can obviously, you need to download the launcher to download the game. And then you just start your game with the shortcut of your game. You don't need to open your launcher every single time. Oh, but he went for the siege work inside the castle. So he doesn't want to go for the outpost, he want to go for the siege. Now we have a very tricky situation for the Gondor player. I don't know if he's able to encounter this. Like, there is Saruman, Lurz, with three combos, with pikemen crossbowmen combination, that means Gondor Knights can't approach them, and he has two Ballista, and three Rams. So he actually goes for it, and that's a very secured way of going for the first siege, which will definitely succeed, even if the Gondor player magically finds a way to crush those three battering Rams, you know? There are two Ballista, which will be nearly impossible for the Gondor player to reach. So I'm kind of curious if he's going to be somehow able to defend this, because there is a Saruman who can eventually steal all your units if you make a wrong approach. The siege will now begin, ladies and gentlemen. And the wall of Gondor is strong, but not strong enough. Bam, bam. And... Plan B, boys, or Plan M, I would like to say, because there is an explosive mine coming. Oh, he cancelled it. You know, he cancelled it, so he doesn't. It doesn't go on cooldown. Oh my goodness, man! You know, there is only one way. If the mine is close to the close to the uh, combos, and the Gondor player has something that can shoot fire, and then it makes boom, and Isengard kills his own units. I think that's the only way Gondor can somehow defend this. Because look at the money from the Gondor player. Look at, his, look at his power points. He's three power points away from his Eagles. And even Eagles couldn't do much in a situation like that. What are the Eagles gonna do? There are too many combos with fire. They will shoot down the Eagles in a second. Fireball is able to one-shot one of the Eagles too. There comes the Fireball. And kill the Trebuchet. One-shot it. Saruman is definitely a goat in the Isengard faction. Boom! Chakalaka, son. And ladies and gentlemen, slowly but surely, the Gunner Castle is turning into a Mordor slash Isengard Castle. Four parts of the wall broken. There comes the Warchan, there comes the full commitment. At this point of the game, you can just press Q to select all your units and then just A click into the Gunner Castle. Close your eyes, and I think you should be victorious. Too many units, too much leadership. Warchan plus Lourdes is all alone 110% more damage. And Warchan plus the leadership from Saruman is 100% armor. So they have double the damage and double the armor and double the experience. Who now has the strength to face against the forces of Isengard in Dunedain? Where was Rohan when Gondor fell? <laughs> there is one single tower guard. Leave one wolf alive and the sheep are never safe. Oh, he's... Oh, he was stealing them. Okay, I was like, what's going on? He stole the combos. 
Yes, two trebuchet, because one of them has destroyed, is destroyed. Couple of Gondor Knights, but again, they cannot approach. The combos are just too powerful with this much leadership. You can't approach them. Boom, Fireball once again. And he even gets money for it, because he has the level 6 pillage from Lourdes. So whenever he kills stuff, he will get money. And also pillage effect got improved in the patch 2.2. That means you will get now more money once you have the scavenger from your spellbook of Mordor. So you need to understand that every faction has now pillage. Lourdes from Isengard, Boromir from Gondor, Eomo from Rohan, and Mordor has the scavenger. But because scavenger is a power point investment, it will give you more, more money than you will get from the pillage. So every faction is now pillage. Mordor with the power points and all the other factions with the heroes. The eagles are coming, boys. Actually, he doesn't have many archers left on the field anymore. But even now, a couple of them, as you can see, are able to one-shot those eagles. Gondor was able to get a lot of power points, but the map control is not looking too bad for Gondor either. Watch this, boys. He got full map control during all this time. He has actually over 3,000, but Isengard is nearly 10,000 in the bank, and he's only 7.5 power points away from the Balrog. But Farhad, the Gondor player, was somehow able to defend himself. Faramir, the captain of... Oh, that was not Faramir, but he, he looked like Faramir. I was confused for a second. I mean, Gondor can eventually come back, but what you need to do, like when you reach this point of the game with Gondor against Isengard, you need full map control with Gondor. Because the second the Balrog will be unlocked, he will be able to kill your base, right? He damaged your base already a lot. That means one Balrog is definitely able to finish it. That, that means you need outpost and you need lots of money from outside. Uh, for a worst case scenario to buy your castle back. That's the only win condition you get. So map control is important and extremely required for a Gondor player for that. Because Isengard is gonna get Balrog, it, you know, in, in, the, in the worst case scenario, when Gondor gets EOD first and kills the army of Isengard, as Isengard losing units, they will unlock the power points they need to summon the Balrog right after. That means outpost control is important. There is an explosive mine, by the way. Gondor has to be careful about this one. Okay, I mean... We need map control. Outpost control. Money is not a problem for Isengard. I mean, it... What? He had like 10,000, but obviously he has to revive Lourdes. And also, as you can see, we have added new revive colors to each faction. So Isengard is like this gray color when the heroes are dead. Gondor will have... Oh my goodness. A wizard is never late, nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. But the question is, can Gandalf do something about this situation? The heroes are still dead. Lourdes is still not around. So level 6 Lourdes has to revive them of 2 minutes. The second he gets level 8, it will be 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Maybe Gondor can abuse the fact, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know. The, he doesn't see what we are able to see. Because Lords is going to be able to join the battlefield now. And because of the explosive mine, Isengard player was actually able to see Gandalf coming. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Because maybe if he wouldn't have seen him coming, he would just commit to this area, and then Gandalf would be able to clean this up, right? But it's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. Outpost has to be captured, definitely. We have now three combos, two works. Palant has been used to get vision, so that's what he's able to see. We have two combos inside the base, no rain. So if he fights around the statues, he might be actually make you know something happen. But again, no fear effect or no debuff on the gun faction either. So these combos are gonna be still way stronger, even with even with the statue being around. And I think it's going to be kind of nearly impossible for the Gondor to defend, but I already said it for the last time, so I don't know. Maybe we're going to see some shenanigans. The question is, how long for the Eagles? The Eagles have still a long cooldown, because with the Eagles, what you can do is you can just try to kill Lords. Eagles dealing crazy amount of damage to heroes, so you can kill Lords and then, you know, pop off with Gandalf. But I don't think that's going to happen. He can summon eventually the Great Company, but... He has one trebuchet, but there are Vork Riders, and they can easily take down the trebuchet. He has one trebuchet on top of the wall. He's trying to protect this. Demolish these buildings, man. That's They are feeding so many power points if you don't demolish them. Look the damage, boys. That's crazy amount of damage. The units are trying to body block the Vorks. 
Lourdes paying attention, obviously. Donadine is always keeping an eye on, on, on Gandalf. And with Lourdes being around, I don't think that Gandalf can ever approach this. Oh, the explosive mine was around. I didn't even see it. Power points are rising to the sky. 14 power points in the bank. We have the red glow animation for the level up for Lourdes. He's now level 7. He's trying. He's trying to beat Lourdes into taking more damage from the rangers. But Lourdes is definitely paying attention. You don't want to test Donadine. You don't want to go for a for a greedy and risky move because he will just pin you. Whenever you are close in the range, he will pin your Gandalf. You won't be able to move for like 30 seconds, which is more than enough time for the combos of Isengard with Lourdes and Saruman to take your Gandalf down. And your most expensive hero, I, I told you, I told you, you cannot... Yeah. You can use Shield Bubble, by the way, manually in this patch, but he doesn't even bother using it. He'll come came a bit delete. And I think that's going to be the winning moment for the Isengard faction, but it's okay, because in the upcoming game, we're going to have the same matchup, but the other way around. GG's going to be called, and that's it, boys. The game number one will be won by, by Dunedain from India. Game over. The game number two, we have the red Isengard player Farad versus the blue Gondor player Dunedain. On the same map, Fidi and Dale in the best of seven finals. And Dunedain is going to open actually with a Barax. And that's going to potentially answer the question of Mateus. He was asking if you can start with a Barax in this game against Isengard. The answer is yes, you can definitely do it. The question is, is Farad going to expect this? That's the big question. If I have Urukpet and Avernus opening, he was not capturing this one behind yet. He's straight up rushing forward, which is a mistake in my opinion. Because you don't need to be that fast, right? You don't need to be that fast. And Dunedain is actually mind gaming his opponent very nicely. So he's not rushing through the middle. He's actually gonna move all the way around this area. Again, unexpected stuff, unpredictable, unpredictable stuff might actually catch your opponent off guard. Warchan is gonna be used to just kill the Peregrine Took, the full of a Took. He's running for his life looking for Gandalf. Gandalf, Gandalf, where are you? I need your assistance. And he's just gonna run into safety, right? He's like Warchant wasted. And the spot is gonna be given up. And the settlement behind not even captured. So what Gondor can do now is he doesn't need to use land on the spot. He can move all the way behind and use it here on this spot, which is like the worst case scenario. And when you play Isengard against good factions like Gondor and Rohan, your early game decision making is extremely important. If you make wrong choices, wrong decisions, your game is going to be doomed at the beginning of the game. You don't want this to happen. Alki Gamer 1, thanks for the primers for the six months, my dude. Appreciate it. Really means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. LK Gamer 1 just resubscribed for six months. Ahoy. Keep up the good work, winking face. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Uh, world Cups 2022, man. I don't know. I don't know, man. I, it's, you know, normally we would have like a world championship. I would like to, but it needs lots of organization and also dedication of time, which I cannot predict if I can do it now. Because in my work, I'm actually quite busy during the summertime. Plus, I have a very, you know, new son who is five days old. So I don't know if I, if I will have the time. If I will have the time, I've, of course, we will do it. But I, I mean, I think... We're gonna have like smaller tournaments, you know, smaller tournaments with like less organization, less time investment. And more of them instead of one big one, which will require lots of organization. I don't think I can do that right now. Gondor is a level 2 soldier. He was losing this one, but it's okay. Isengard is gonna get away for now, but he won't be able to capture this. I mean, he can, but he will lose it right after. And look at this, he's spamming soldiers every single time. World Cup $10,000 reward. Dude, that would be amazing, but I think the only possible way we can actually make this happen is if some a big company is gonna sponsor this tournament, you know? Like, I'm always jealous because in, in Age of Empires 2, I see always big tournaments, you know, sponsored by Red Bull and sponsored by this company, by this company, by this company, all the time. And nobody cares about Lord of the Rings game, unfortunately, you know? I mean, it's abandoned, so I can't even blame companies for it. But imagine, you know, imagine a company reaching out to us and say, hey, with our brand, you put our logo in your in your videos, in your stream, and you are able to host a tournament for $10,000, you know? We are, we are, you know, sponsoring this tournament. How epic this would be, you know what I'm saying? I'm pretty certain that even players 
from 10 years ago would actually come to, the, to play the game uh, because of the rewards. Would be kind of epic. Gondor is actually creeping a lot. Building the steeple now, the first Gondorite is upon the, uh, you know, on the way from the steeple. Eco from Isengard is looking kind of, kind of really, really bad actually. Gondor's eco is looking amazing, amazing. You know what's gonna be the main problem? This level four soldier battalion. Isengard has no answer to this because level advantage in this game means so much that even a war chanted Urukai level one cannot fight them in a one-on-one -on -one situation. A level four soldier is gonna hit like a truck. Trust me, that one, guys, you have no chance against that. And there is even a hobbit who is, by the way, level 5. Dude, this hobbit with the rocks, good luck dealing with this. He's creeping the whole map. Whole map. Like, he was able to get two power points on top of the hill before the first Gondonite came on the field. That's amazing, man. Amazing. I mean, that's gonna be a quick game, I think, because Isengard is just not ready. He's not ready. He has just recaptured the, the second settlement. <laughs> he has only one meal all game long with no wood bonus. You need at least two lumbers to actually get the wood bonus of 10%. If you don't have, if you have only one, you have zero bonuses. Before the Urukpir hits level two or just after the Urukpir hits level two, he has the first Gondor Knight upon the field, even though the start of the Gondor player was a bit delayed because of the barracks opening, but I think it's paying off. And that's what you need to achieve. When you go for the barracks opening, you gotta achieve something. You need to either hurt the economy from your opponent a lot, or you need to creep as much as you potentially can. We need the old legends back, yeah, man. That would be, I mean, that would be so epic, boys. You know, I remember the day when they shut down the servers of BFME 1. It was so nice back in the day, boys, you know, you have like, you had like every single time, in every single hour, you had over 500 people being online, you could always find some games to play. It was so nice. And once they shut down the servers, like, I would see 85 to 90% of the people just left, you know what I'm saying? Because nobody knew about Game Ranger back in the day. They were like, okay, the game's multiplayer is done forever, you know? But only few people knew that they, that they can move to the Game Ranger application and play the game. I think... That still, mo you know, many, many people in the world would like to play this game online, but they just don't know how. You know what I'm saying? Oh my goodness, man. Level 5 Gondonite with heavy armor plus forge blades. It's gonna demolish everything, and that's gonna be it, boys. That was a very fast level, you know, game number 2 from Tunadine. Incredible performance, and snowball the lead into a quick victory. GG Wobblit. 2-0. Age of Meteorology soundtrack still the best. Yeah, man. Okay, so we have the blue Isengard player Donadine facing against the red Rohan player Farad at the bottom right side. So Figurashi Forest, that's a bigger map definitely than the, than the map we have seen before the Firian deal. Because the player has the chance to open with three settlements. Three untouched in unprotected settlements. So that means that there are no creeps around you need to clear first. You can just take them at the beginning of the game, which will kind of like when I would play Rohan in this match, in this map, what I would like to do is I would open only with one farm and grab all these three at the same time without waiting any second. You know what I'm saying? But what he does is a little bit of a mistake because he opens with double farm and recruits two extra peasants. And again, they are a bit more expensive in this match, which will force him to wait additionally here when you have to make a choice between the farm inside and your outside of the base always choose the outside one why are you asking glad you asking because the farm inside is always going to be rank one but the farm outside will always start at rank two which means it's a bit tankier and also most importantly it gives you more money so very important if a uruk pit and furnace opening the same situation here i would skip the furnace and go for the uruk pit only and then grab those three settlements ASCP without wasting any seconds Why is everyone playing random? They don't play random. They actually picked factions in this tournament. I mean, you are asking generally why they are playing random. It's like a habit, you know? You don't have to pick random, but I think it's like, um, it's something people got used to over the years. 
But in this tournament, nobody is picking random. We always get matchup pick. In the next matchup, it's gonna be the same matchup, but the other way around. Hobbit is kinda kiting around a little bit. And the Uruks are just too strong, you know? <laughs> they have not even the draft. Draft has way less cooldown, as you can see, it's reloading quite fast. And that was one of the things which was annoying me the most in the, in the previous versions of the patch, of the game. Um, the draft had like too long cooldown. And then sometimes we had like peasants running around like plebs without weapons. They are weaker than orcs. They are as weak as lumbermen workers. It was kind of annoying me. That means that's the reason why we actually lowered the cooldown of the draft. So player can actually use that more often. It's only an early game ability anyway. It's not a game breaking change. Talking about this map, we have creeps. You know, on, it's a symmetrical map. First of all, every new map we added to the patch 2.2 is symmetrical, which is important to make the maps as balanced as we potentially can. The maps from the original BFME 1 are not symmetrical. You know, they are kind of unbalanced. They are favoring a player when he is playing on, on the right side, for example, or on the left side. But we don't want this to happen. We wanted to make sure that every player, regardless of the side he's playing on, has the same circumstances, same standpoint, standing point, than the other player on the other side. Will there ever be a matchmaking for BFME 1? I wish we could make this possible. I mean, you need to make an extern thing, which will cost you thousands of dollars, actually, to make this happen. And you need to also maintain this then afterwards, you know what I'm saying? It's not like you need to, you don't need to only pay one single time and you are done with it. It's an investment every single month. Again, it's not a commercial project that we are doing, nothing is for sale, and it's not possible, unfortunately, you know, at this, at this point of the, of the time. Again, for the future, we don't know, maybe we can make it possible, but for now, it seems to be impossible. If the Rohirrim on the field, um, Isengard's eco is looking dope. Like, look at his base, boys. He's almost full base. The pikemen coming on the field the second the Rohirrim are approaching. The Rohan player will be able to deny this creep, hopefully. They're very important to deny. Very important for Rohan to creep. Because Rohan has to get Elven ally special summon from the spellbook. And for now, he is not doing good. He didn't touch any of these Lamy mills yet. Look at them. Almost level 2, which means more money. He has 20% wood bonus. Cheaper building, for example, a furnace which normally costs 350, costs you only now 280. So that's a huge deal, by the way. 70 less resources for a production resource building at the beginning of the game is a massive advantage. Massive advantage. Isengard is growing extremely strong. So Benjo, he has lords on the field. He has built. He's building up the war pit. Um, Lourdes is a great hero against Rohirrim. Uh, Rohirrim are a bit weaker in terms of armor against arrows in compared to the Gondor Knights. So Lourdes can kill them way faster than he could kill Gondor Knights. That's why upgrades are essential. Armor is a bit cheaper in this patch, so you need to only invest 1200 now instead of 1300 to build the armory. It's building up faster, uh, but again, you know, it doesn't mean that you get it for free. You still need to invest time and money to get it done. And then they will be a bit more tanky. And also, Rohan is a bit better faction against Isengard than Gondor is. For example, against Gondor, Isengard doesn't need freezing rain. But against Rohan, you need. Because Rohan is generally, spe is, you know, generally speaking more leadership available. Only Theorin gives you level 1 leadership, which is great and amazing. And that is the reason why Isengard needs freezing rain. And also, spamming pikes all alone is not going to be helpful against Rohan, because Rohan can easily recruit some swordmen, the peasants, from the farms, and counter your pikemen. It means you need war riders, you need more interactive gameplay against, against Rohan when you play Isengard, than you would need against Gondor. Hey Kai Polit, welcome my friend, glad to see you around. I'm, I'm doing fine, thank you very much for asking. I couldn't stream for a long time because, you know, of our newborn baby. He was born five days ago and we were in the hospital multiple times and, you know, with the doctor. We wanted to make sure everything is okay. And now it's born, it's home since five days and everything is okay. And here, here I am. But Berserk are shredding peasants, yeah, true. But again, when you combine with the, your Rohirrim with the, with the peasants, so you send peasant forward to counter the enemy pikemen and then you 
try and pull down the Berserker, you should be in a good spot because the Berserker are actually kind of expensive. They cost 180 each, so they are cheaper here in this patch. They used to cost only two. They used to cost actually 200. They are cheaper now, but they are still expensive. I mean, oh, be careful, be careful. Yeah, look, Lourdes is putting so much pressure, you know? Lourdes is putting so much pressure on him. Oh my goodness, don't tell me, don't tell me. Oh, that's her. Oh, that's, that's really painful, man. Like, you don't understand, guys. That's one of the major differences between BFME 1 and BFME 2 and Rise of the Witch King. Losing units in this game is so painful. It will, you know, kind of crush your momentum incredibly. And you will suffer from it. For the next five minutes, you know? Losing units is a no-go. Don't lose units. Don't risk it. Come, peasants, we must rise and fight. Rise up and fight. What is the name of the what is the name of the boy? It's Aras. Aras. This is his name. Oh, Palantir. It's also a new visual effect we added to the patch. So you can see and tell visually if the units are affected by the Palantir. Lourdes is a Rohirrim sniper. He has killed the second battalion. And that might be it, boys. Look at the minimap. You know, it's looking phenomenal for the. It's looking phenomenal for Isengard player Donadine. He's looking extremely strong. Oh my goodness. I mean, Donadine is just popping off, you know? Hello, warriors of Rohan and Gondor. Hey, Patri uh, Patrino. Welcome, my friend. Glad to see you around. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, you know, you hear like laborers being recruited, it's also very important, quick tip for you, when you build a lumber mill, you always want to build additional lumber mills. So there is not a magical or the perfect number for it, but I would always recommend it bare minimum 7 workers. 7 workers for each lumber mill is a great number, you can have 8, you can have 9, in the worst case you can have 6, but 7 to 8 is a great number, in the, but they come always with 4. So you have only 4 workers at the beginning when you build up the lumber mill and you always want to build at bare minimum 3 more of them. It's very important. At bare minimum. To get ma faster money. And uh, that's, that's, that hurts already, you know? You need to build a tower now for the defense. Tony OP I would like to see versus Shanks. Yeah, I will play against them. But first of all, let me train up a little bit, you know? <laughs> because I haven't touched this game since two weeks, you know? I'm quite rusty, so I would like to play a couple of games before facing against such a beast, you know? Such a beast from the east. Because I would just embarrass myself right now, to be honest with you. We can kind of schedule a game maybe for the, for the, for the Sunday or for Monday. And then we can get some set done, best of five. With the same format, I like this format actually quite a lot. And we can have some fun. Lourdes is the best hero. True. I mean, can't disagree with this one. Shanks, if you want, I can help you to warm up. I will go easy on you, I promise. I can end it. <laughs> I mean, he's struggling. He's struggling. Oh my goodness, this guy's already going for better on Rams. He doesn't want to joke around, you know? He doesn't want to give Rohan the chance to get into the mid to lead game. Rohan's lead game is actually quite quite strong. Especially if you get somehow... If you find the same... The way to get Theodin level 4, but he never ever recruited Theodin. Also in this patch, Eoma is just much better. More reliable. So when you play Rohan, you want to go for Eoma. Eoma is very strong. He levels up way faster now, and you can get him level 4 way sooner than before. And then you have the insane leadership bonuses for your Rohirrim and Rohirrim Archer. And then you can even fight this Pikeman. But the heroes... The, you need, the thing about the heroes for the Rohan faction is, it will slow you down for now, but after like 3 to 5 minutes, they will be worth every single penny. So, for example, Ilma could snipe those rams, you know what I'm saying? He could just spear throw them, almost one-shot them. Eowyn can one-shot them. Rohan has only two farms outside. There's a couple of Rohirrim, but he never was able to go to the space yet. Armory is coming up. He went for the siege before the armory, by the way, guys. Can you imagine that? He, wanna, he doesn't want to joke around it. Oh, he went for the armory. 
but he didn't... Okay, he didn't buy fire arrows, I think. Yeah, he didn't buy fire and he didn't buy banner. That's why he's rebuilding it. Oh my goodness, man. Maybe he doesn't even need fire, to be honest with you. I think the second he breaks in... Like, you can't reach these ramps now, right? You, how can you... How you want to reach them? You can't. Unlike Gondor, Rohan can't build trebuchet expansion on top of the wall. That means they will definitely break in. You know, they will definitely break in. Where was Gondor when Higurashi, Higurashi for us fell? Three rams. Four rams. He's spamming rams, by the way. I just hear ram, ram, ram. Here, ram there. Ram here, ram there, you know? One part of the wall has been broken. You don't want to go... Like, when you want to commit, you don't want to go into a tiny spot like this, you know? I I remember the, I remember it happened to me one single time. I was playing Rohan against Isengard. I was in a very good... A very similar situation against Isengard. And then they broke this part of the wall. You see this small part? And then he wanted to go in with two combos. And I had Legolas, guys. I swear to you. I hoax strike. My Legolas was level 2. I killed two combos on the same spot. With one single hit. And then my Legolas got level 6. From one single hook strike. And I turned the game around and won. He was so tilted after this one. I think it was like two years ago. I was losing hardcore. And then he wanted to pass through this tiny spot. In which they were clumped like crazy. And Legolas hook strike can actually deal splash damage. And I got like four or five levels from it. Hearing King got crippled. And taken down. Can we not make peace, Theodine Horse Master? Eternal, glad to see you around. Joe is in the chat. Joe, I have I'm a, I'm a dad now, my friends. I didn't have time. I have I had other responsibilities. GG well played. Dronine is undefeated in the series so far. It's 3-0. He needs only two more wins to become the champion of the 1v1 championship. At the bottom right, we have the blue Rohan player Dronadine against the red Isengard player Farad. Who is unfortunately 3-0 behind. The first game was kind of close. Gondor was able to defend himself quite nicely. But other, other than that, the other two games we have watched now, Dunedain was just perform all performing his opening big time. But maybe that's going to be the matchup. I like the opening from Farad. I personally think that's the best opening in this map. Uruk pit opening, but I don't like the positioning from the Uruk pit. Remember what I told you guys in the first, in the, in the first game. The positioning is very important. It's your most important structure inside your castle. And if you build it here, your opponent later on, not now, but later on, will have the chance to easily commit on this one and take it down. When you build the Uruk Pit, try to build it here. Here or here. In these three spots behind. One of them. Because it's gonna be harder for your opponent to reach later on. This is just too easy. He can use Elvin Wood here. He can use Elvin Elias here and then just commit on it. In losing the Uruk Pit, Will cost you so much time. So, Urukpit, he's capturing... Oh, he stole this already. Like, very smart move. He went straight up forward with one of the peasants and actually stole it from uh, away from him. <laughs> you know, very nice move. I like that, to be honest with you. He needs to use Warchant here. He has to use for here. I hope he doesn't use it here. He used it. Oh, he used it for whatever reason. Look, in a one-on-one -on -one situation, you don't have to use Warchan on your Uruks to fight against peasants. The Uruks are already able to win against them. The Uruks can win the 1v1 against Orcs and against Soldiers without the need of the Warchan too. The only reason why you would use Warchan is when it's not a 1v1 situation or when you want to kill them a bit faster. In this situation, capturing this one is not going to be a great decision making because it will be harder to be protected. Losing this on the other side is going to be way more painful. Because look at this. Not only did he lost the meal, but he will also lose so much time. And there is a chance this person is going to hit level 2. And it does hit level 2. Now, it will, this person is going to devastate your Uruks now. Big time. You have no chance against them. You will lose your settlement. And you will lose like 30 seconds before you can recapture it. Like... It's a RTS game. It's based on your decision making. And your decisions can actually screw you up at the beginning of the game. Again, Isengard, when you play Isengard against good factions, you need to be careful. Early game. You need to be patient. You need to be smart about which Blammer meal you want to you want to capture first. Which one you need to protect, which one you can give up. When you don't make it right, your game will be doomed in two minutes and you will lose the game in five.
even though he beat me in the semifinals, I want him to win. <laughs> you just want to have this satisfaction. Okay, I lost against the champion. You know, that's 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 the reason why you want him to win. I mean, like look at this. He has only one Uruk pit in the base, boys. He has really, really bad eco. He can't even make more Uruks now. He can't even recapture one of the settlements yet. And Rohan has the stable. He has three farms inside the base. And again, this one is going to be taken down. That's what I try, was trying to say, right? He can't protect this for a long time. In a mill, when you build it up, you need to at least have it like a minute under your control to get the money back from it. So if you build a mill and you lose it before 16, 60 seconds, it will make you lose money, then earn money, right? Especially if you don't demolish it in time. He didn't demolish this one and he will encounter now another level 2 peasant. Which again will be a painful experience because level 2 peasants are, we are here to protect our lands. eating like a truck. And there comes the Roy hitting boys. Oh god. <laughs> oh god. And it's gonna be rough. Spam, you know, it, exactly. When you play Rohan, your Rohan is an overall perfect faction for beginners and also for great experienced players. It's an advanced it. gameplay. Like your strength, your your power power of your faction relies on the early game. And you you, you know your chance to actually recruit so many extra Oh my goodness. That, you see? <laughs> you see? Oh, that's CG already. That's CG already. The pikes couldn't even enter the battlefield. Like, now he can just commit... Isengard has no money at all. Like, he's poor. He has two power points, he can go for the industry, but he doesn't have any furnaces. Maybe you can't win. <laughs> okay, so the score is gonna be 4-0, and the only chance for Farah to turn this around is actually winning the upcoming five games in a row. What a performance from the Rohan player, Tonadine, not only in this game, but also in this finals overall. Very nice, very good.